And now it's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker for this morning service, the Reverend Dr. John Burens. These are no times to be without friends. And so it's especially good that we gather here this morning to consciously cultivate spiritual friendship, which requires intentionality. It requires recognizing a, a virtual moral imperative that my promoting of your full spiritual and moral development is the key to my growing my own soul. Community organizers, I think, know this at their very core. That promoting relationships that transcend differences in age and gender and orientation and social class and theology and race, well, that's just essential to developing just and inclusive community. We Unitarian Universalists often forget, however, that it is our own transcendentalist forebears who were among the very first Americans to embrace and practice such spiritual friendships in the service of social justice. And their stories, I think, are worthy of our honor. Let me start with just one. 160 years ago today, on the 1st of March in 1860, the Unitarian minister Theodore Parker arrived in Rome. He was only 50 years old, but he knew that he was dying. Like so many in his time, he had consumption, tuberculosis, then incurable. All that Boston doctors had to offer was the recommendation to get thee to a warmer climate. So he and his wife had tried first the Caribbean that winter and then the Mediterranean. Thanks to funds raised among the literally thousands who regarded Parker as Boston's leading and most eloquent preacher. I do not pretend to understand the moral universe, he once wrote. The ark is a long one, and the, my eye reaches but a little way. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by the experience of my sight. I can divine it only by conscience. And from what I see, I am sure it bends toward justice. Passed on by another Unitarian minister 50 years later, a century later, that phrase was repeated quite often by Dr. King. Another from Parker would become even more famous. Government of the people, by the people, for the people. Also comes from Parker, but was passed on by Lincoln's law partner back in Springfield, Illinois to be incorporated in the last sentence of his Gettysburg Address. In Rome, Parker sat for the Boston-born sculptor William Wetmore Story, one of whose statues is in the de Young Museum in San Francisco. He made a clay portrait of Parker's head. Story was the son of Supreme Court Justice Joseph Story, who had ruled in favor of the Africans aboard the famous ship Amistad and let them go free. Parker was an even more radical opponent of slavery. As one of the secret six who had backed John Brown's attempt to spark a slave insurrection earlier that winter, he was almost lucky to be out of the country. Two of his fellow transcendentalists had had to flee to Canada, evading arrest for supporting the martyred Brown, who had been tried and hung just in December. While he was in Rome, Parker received a letter from his staunchest friend in the Unitarian ministry, James Freeman Clark, 
when almost no other minister in Boston would exchange pulpits with Parker because he was considered just too radical, both religiously and politically, Clark was his true spiritual friend. Although it nearly cost him his own church and his own career. Now he wrote in a warm, bantering way about how he had preached that Sunday to Parker's flock, which was so large that at times it overflowed the biggest auditorium in the city of Boston, the music hall, which seated 2,500. They behaved well, Parker said. They were as reverent as most congregations. Even when I told them how much I loved you, though I don't agree with your theology at all. Parker was one who based his thinking on what he called absolute religion, which is what we would today probably refer to as ethical humanism. Clark still considered himself very much a disciple of Jesus, unburdened uh, by doctrines about him. He wanted to practice the religion of Jesus, even as he studied other faith traditions, later becoming America's first professor of comparative religion at Harvard. Yet Clark and Parker were both allies for racial, gender, and other forms of social justice, starting with equal educational opportunity for the poor and for women. Clark wrote that Boston conservatives, many of them tied to profits in slave pick cotton going to northern textile mills, had recently put up a statue on the lawn of the Beacon Hill State House. A statue of Saint Daniel, he called him, meaning Senator Daniel Webster, who had worked with Henry Clay of Kentucky to forge the infamous Compromise of 1850, bringing California's gold into the Union, you know, had a cost. We were to be a free state, meaning the Constitution did not mention slavery. But it included implicit permission to displace the Native American population. And that at the cost of a fugitive slave law that made citizens of Massachusetts furious. Emerson. The mild spokesperson for the Transcendentalists wrote in his journal, this filthy law was penned by human beings in the 19th century who can read and write, but I will not obey it by God. Clark said that a heavenly downpour had drowned with disdain the dedication of Daniel Webster's statue, and ironically had sent thousands running for refuge where? into Parker's meeting house, the music hall, where he said plans were then formulated by the more progressive people to put a matching statue on the other wing of the state house lawn, this one to their fellow Unitarian, Horace Mann, the crusader for ed public quality education, who had just died. Parker himself died on the 10th of May, 1860. I went to his graveside last January, in part to put flowers there. And then when I spoke to the keeper of the cemetery, I was stunned to discover that Frederick Douglass, by then the most famous African-American or ex-slave, had arranged in 1887, 27 years after Parker died, to arrive on the very anniversary of his death. And not only to place flowers, but that evening he sat and wrote to the son of suffragist Elizabeth Cady Stanton that right after getting off the overnight train from Rome and taking coffee, he'd hastened to Parker's grave and realized that it was inadequate. A mere marker flat in the ground 
perhaps all the Parker's widow had been able to afford when he died. He wrote, a man like that should have a monument that is a sermon in itself. And then went back to Rome and commissioned William Wetmore's story to carve the marble monument that stands there today. One that refers to Parker as the great American preacher and ends with the inscription, his name is here inscribed in marble. His virtues on the hearts of those whom he saved from slavery and superstition. I don't know about you, but I found that bond between two people crossing racial lines in the 19th century just incredibly moving. But I'm not here to talk just about the past. As the Universalist minister Clinton Lee Scott once put it, it's always easier to pay homage to the prophets than it is to heed the direction of their vision. It's easier blindly to venerate the saints than to learn the human quality of their sainthood. It is easier to glorify the heroes of the past than to give weight to their examples in our own lives. To worship the wise is much easier than to profit from their wisdom. The grandchildren of those who stone the prophets sometimes gather up the stones to build their monuments. Always it is easier to pay homage to prophets than to heed the direction of their vision. Now I'm here to try to point us today to live in a direction pointed to even more directly by some of the women among the transcendentalist movement. Take Elizabeth Peabody or Margaret Fuller or Lydia Mariah Child, who for years edited the National Anti-Slavery Standard, or that most overlooked of early Unitarian feminists, Carolyn Healy Dahl, who wanted her sisters, then seeking their first rights to speak out in public, or to go to college, or to vote, also to speak out about such issues as domestic violence, gender economics, prostitution, and other topics that some considered, well, not fit for mixed company. She went on to found the American Social Science Association and her, and her sisters in the effort to gain women the right to vote, Susan Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, you may know after the Civil War actually divided the women's rights movement over race. They opposed giving black men the right to vote before white women got it. They used despicably racist language in the process and created what one feminist historian has called the myth of Seneca Falls, writing people like Carolyn Healy Dahl and Margaret Fuller who were more important foremothers of the feminist movement in America, almost out of the story and out of history. I try to revive them. Douglas, you know, was the only black male present when, who signed on to Stanton's declaration at Seneca Falls. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men and women are created equal. By the way, should you ever wonder what it means to say that there's a patriarchal or white supremacy culture still to be demand, dismantled here in, in America, I would ask you to ponder some of these historic realities. My own theory of history in relation to Parker's is that I too cannot see the whole moral arc any more clearly than he did, but I do know this. Our attitude toward the future is forever a matter of existential faith. Parker, like most of the transcendentalists, was a grandchild of the revolution. Uh, his grandfather had led the Minutemen on the Lexington Battle Green 
The same morning that Emerson's grandfather watched the fight break out at the Old North Bridge in Concord from the windows of the old manse. Margaret Fuller's grandfather was a minister who gave up his pulpit to go into politics in the revolution. Her, by the, her, and that inspired her own father to become a congressman. Writing back from Washington, tell little Margaret that I love her if she learns her Latin. By her adolescence, she was probably the most educated woman in America, though there were no colleges for women to go to. And at 20, she was studying German with her age mate, James Freeman Clark, nearly every day, causing him to write in a journal, I hesitate to come to you, Margaret, when I have no fresh ideas. And her to reply, what makes you think I'm interested in your ideas? <laughs> Why not be as you are and bring me yourself? Soon they realized that they were destined to be lifelong spiritual friends. Not lovers, not that Margaret would have been made a very good minister's wife. She would have made a better minister had that been possible in her time. No, she stimulated other women in conversation. Conversations held at Elizabeth Peabody's bookshop, which was the true center of transcendentalism, not Concord, right in downtown Boston. And it's where Clark, with Peabody's help, started the very first transcendentalist religious fellowship on the simple principle, we need not think alike to love alike. So maybe you don't need me to say this, friends, but today, from any clear historical viewpoint, these United States and the heritage of democracy have never been more divided or imperiled. Issues of justice, racial, gender, class, sexual justice, all of these are in danger in a time that is more like the run-up to the Civil War than any I have ever experienced in my life. Into that tragic division back in 1860, here in California, transcendentalism appeared in the person of the Reverend Thomas Starr King whose pulpit I later had the honor of occupying for a time. In the last four years of his life, he died at only 39, you know, of exhaustion and diphtheria. He moved new spiritual friends around this great state to do four memorable things. First to vote, as I hope all of you will do on Tuesday, if you have not done so already to vote out those who were defending traditional hierarchies based on race and gender and class and ethnicity, and to promote what he called unionism. Second, to be generous. He raised more money than anybody else in the country to relieve the suffering caused by civil war. Third, to be both soulful and creative. Around him, he created essentially the most important circle of writers and artists that this state ever saw, with people like Bret Hart and that first great photographer of the Western landscape, Carlton Watkins, who worked with him to save the Yosemite Valley for future generations. Emerson visiting here in California just the year before he died in 1871, spoke from what had been Star King's pulpit and was remembered for having knocked over the flowers that morning. But then he went up to Yosemite, spent a day with John Muir, who had read Emerson's book, Nature, when he was first a student 
studying botany. Talked with him in the Mariposa Grove for an entire day. Wanted to stay overnight, but his son wouldn't hear of it. And then, as he was taken back to the city by his younger companions, he turned to remark, you know that fellow Muir may be a better naturalist than even Thoreau was. May we, even in our time, do all we can to be the kind of deep spiritual friends one to another that the transcendentalists were and to sustain one another in a persistent pursuit of justice, in a enhancing one another's deepest spiritual creativity, that true community and democracy might survive in our time. So may it be. Amen. <laughs>